Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Chris Caligari, and I'm your host for uh, this week's uh, Kubvert weekly meeting. And um, as always, we record these sessions and post them out to YouTube. Um, I have posted the link to our meeting notes out in chat. And if you could please add your name to the attendees list. Um, we always appreciate having documentation on who's attending. Okay, let's get into it. Um, I'm looking at the list and I see familiar names. So nobody new this week. So we can get right into the agenda, which is empty. So how about we wait a minute or two and if somebody would like to fill in a, an agenda item. <clears throat> Okay, while we're, uh, while we're filling out those agenda items, um, we can get started with the first one. Uh, Itamar, uh, take her away. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I was think, thinking about adding another uh, lane, uh, similar to make generate, to basically ensure that no one forgets to update their dependencies before issuing a PR. Um, I think that's very valuable because um, not long ago there was a situation that somebody updated uh, a, um, a commit manually to the vendor directory, and then when I when I tried to to update the dependencies, it basically override this this uh, commit. Um, yeah, so I think it could be very valuable. Um, yeah, I agree. Uh, that would be very valuable. Just there should just be one detail here that we cannot do make depths update because it would really update go dependencies. We would have to just use this sub part where, where we are, where we do go mod vendor or something to keep the tree in sync without updating the dependencies. But it would be very valuable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want to tackle that, that would be great. So what, what happened here? Somebody manually updated something in the vendor directory? Is that, yes. Could we hash? Uh, it's not necessary. So what, what, what Idamar said is uh, completely valid. So there is a command for go mod where, 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 you, where, where it really synchronizes the vendor content with what is in go mod. So any changes you would do manually would be reverted on the job. And we then like with make generate and our format checking, you would see that there is a diff which should not be there. I honestly thought that's already happening because I, I think I, I had a messed up vendor directory a, a few days ago and I got a failure because of some diff after generate, I think. That was probably because the format or something so a difference, but not because of ah, okay. this yeah. check. So you were lucky in this case. Oh, or yeah, lucky, unlucky. <laughs> David, does that make sense for you? As long as there's a way to detect these changes, that's reliable. That's that's all I care about. Yeah, that's what it would do. <laughs> And to clarify, I just uh, I think I understood like fifty percent of what you said. Uh, we're not pulling the dependencies every time in a lane, are are we? To verify this, it would just be a um, some sort of validation of the Go mod and vendor directory are in sync. I, I, how would what are the mechanics behind this? Maybe clarify that one more time for me. Sorry. So to be honest, I don't know if. Uh, if it would detect changes, at least adversity, we would really, 
first fully delete the vendor directory and then run the command to sync the go mod file with vendor vendor and then it would download everything. Yeah, you would you would run yeah, you, you would run um ideally go mod tidy, then go mod vendor and check if there's a git diff for the vendor for the right directory. Maybe delete yeah. it before because I think it doesn't delete stuff on its own. Yeah, and then that's what we did, yeah. Go mod vendor. And that it might download the dependencies newly um from the respective go um proxy but um because we don't have a shared go mod cache but it shouldn't be an issue uh, that's what i'm worried about like it shouldn't be an issue but now we've opened uh, our merge gating to all these repos being accessible um that's why go mod already has like there's a go cache a, yeah. a public one and Oh, we already sure. do that anyways. Like we, we, for every build, we need to pull them. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, we, no. yeah. we, we explicitly disable it <laughs> in our oh. builds because we have everything in vendor. But yeah. Um, yeah so, yeah. Okay, maybe we should get it for that job. Well, yeah, I don't know. That, I mean, that, that's the whole reason we use the vendor directory is so we aren't uh, necessarily dependent on the availability of all these repos. Right, so it should definitely be a separate lane that does nothing else, and we don't want to yeah. pull for the other ones. What if we just created a uh, when somebody run, runs make depths, whatever update, uh, we just hash the vendor directory and commit that hash, and then we just have a lane that checks that the vendor directory matches the expected hash. Yeah, but they were also like if somebody changes the vendor directory, then they would also r hopefully run something. No, okay, they they yeah. They have to. Use it doesn't prevent somebody from target. rehashing and committing the hash as well. They have to use the make target to to really make it work. I mean, yeah. <laughs> they yeah. It doesn't protect from pr purposely breaking, but it protects from accidentally breaking. I, yeah. th I think that's what we're most concerned about is accidental yeah. breaking. Like, for example, uh, somebody going into their vendor directory and uh, modifying something. Sometimes it's not even obvious you're working in a vendor directory. If you're tunneling through the code, an IDE takes you to a vendor portion of code within, I think it lets you modify yeah. that stuff. Yeah. And <laughs> you might not be aware. I, I'm fine with whatever approach we take here to guarantee the uh, consistency of our vendor directory. I want to avoid any approach that uh, requires pulling bits over the network from external sources that may or may not be available, simply because that has the potential to block our ability to merge. So at no point do we want somebody else's repos availability or our ability to even reach out to it uh, to impact our ability to merge. Okay, sounds good to me. Thanks for that uh, comment. Okay, thank you, Aramar. Um, next issue, follow up on non root testing. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we discussed uh, last time the non root testing. Actually, it was in April. <laughs> so <clears throat> I will just remind the <clears throat> remind the final version, uh, and that was that we will add the testing lines for the non-root. Uh, after that, I was I was going to open a PR on the Qubit project uh, CI, uh, and we discovered that it will just add a lot of lines that we don't or can't actually run now because the CI status is uh, as it is. Um, so we discussed this with Frederico and we decided that we will go with just a periodic job uh, that we will run uh, daily. 
and it will block the block the release. And I would need to just discuss this solution if it's okay with everyone. And yeah, that's it. I'm curious why we can't. Uh, why don't we just enable non root? and always use it. And then there would be some cases that require root and just mash it all together in our current test lanes. So we discussed this the last time. Uh, Sorry, <clears throat> so we don't here. want, so we don't want to make a default uh, because we want to also test the code path of non root uh, for the virtual machines that are running in the production. So we don't bring something. So we need to also test uh, the root implementation. Sorry. I'm not completely following it. Uh, we, we would test both root and, oh, so here's my understanding. There's some code paths, um, like I think maybe huge pages, if I remember your PR, uh, that require root and some yes. that, that don't. So the features, I guess my expectation would be that the features that require root silently, at least right now, have root just get enabled on them. And the ones that don't require root uh, by default, we just don't use root. So it's just a toggle on our, our pod. Um, if we approach it that way, why can't we just use the existing test lanes and naturally test cases that require root will continue to use root. The ones that don't will um, not. Add not quite getting it, I guess. So there is a problem that you have the existing workload, so you want to also uh, test the root uh, path. This is the first. The second uh, problem is that you can't reliably uh, decide if you need the root or non-root. For example, if you pass through some devices uh, or modify and and or use the sidecars, then uh, we are not sure if you need the root implementation or non root. That's interesting. The f what, what was the first one you said? I get the devices in the sidecar. Uh, you said existing workloads. So yeah, just to just to have the compatibility. So existing workloads compatibility. Um, yes. You're saying uh, is this an update case? So somebody had a previous kubevert, and they want to update to the next kubevert, and the concern would be that they wouldn't be able to restart an existing workload. Uh, they yeah. would transition it from a. Um... Okay. Yeah, I mean, we cannot do the non default because, for example, if you have an automation and the automation requires the root implementation, but we will not provide it, then the automation will start to fail. I guess the past that Lou um, um, was trying to say that uh, we need to test this. For example, if you want a virtual machine to start uh, with CPU pinning uh, with root and then the same thing without root, we still need to keep uh, the other option that if people want yeah. to, at least for, for a certain amount of time. Well, hmm. I'm a little concerned about the release blocking because it, it lacks visibility until somebody pushes the button to make the release and then it's urgent. So what, I mean, we could go a week without noticing that the periodic is failing and then try to make the release, realize that it's failing and then I have to unwind. I don't know. I... Yeah, I'm. I'm also scared by this. <laughs> uh, we will just. We, keep... we could. We could use the the email alert uh, capability of Test Read to get emails if uh, one of the periodic start failing, so that we don't need to be watching a Slack channel. Um, 
maybe just subscribe to some mailing list and get an alert or I mean, an email if, if the test starts failing or something like that. How much noise will that create? Like, what's our, like, we're talking about the entire test suite passing or failing. So, what's our pass rate? I, I'm not talking about necessarily, like, we have a successful um, run. I would expect it to mostly pass, but sometimes CI infrastructure has issues and other stuff that would create mm -hmm. noise. So, I'm, I'm saying if I see this a lot, I'm not going to go investigate it because it requires time. I agree. Um, yeah, I can just tell that. Uh, I mean, it is month from the initial PR, probably, and I had to rebase it four times, and probably two times uh, something got broke. Uh, so, in the non root implementation, so it is a pain. What's the minimum amount of testing that we need to get this merged? Can we add just some test cases that cover um, high impact um, code paths for non root and get this merged? So add new tests to our existing test suites that exercise us? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it can break on anything, right? Uh, for example, Cisco. Uh, missing permission for Cisco or some file system changes, maybe some devices. Uh, for example, new features as is the custom kernel. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot. And I'm not sure what should we cover as basics. What would you define as a basics? So non root today is it's an opt in feature today. Right. Okay. Um, I would consider it experimental to start out with. It's an opt in feature, and we just get enough test coverage to ensure that uh, at least the basics, we're, we're at least holding it together uh, for now. So, for example, what would we need? What would we need to feel comfortable that we can upgrade to a new Libvirt QMU stack? and have a reasonable expectation that non-root continues to work. That's the kind of test coverage that I would want initially just to get this merged. Uh, probably we could pick the compute line for the basics. And I mean, networking has some advanced stuff in the networking as the top devices, uh, top uh, CNI. Or for SROE and the storage has some other kinds of storage. So can we take these tests, these tests that already exist today, make them a table, and then pass in the ability to have a test case that runs at root and non-root. That's that's what I would. That's my inclination, or um, my instinct says that we should take the existing tests, identify the ones that we really want to verify work on non-root and not duplicate them, but just create a table to toggle both running them root and non-root and let that be the initial um, testing. So not a new lane, but use the existing tests and run them twice. Does anyone else, have, I'm talking a lot. Does anyone else have any opinion, other opinions? I'm just trying to avoid the scenario where we, I, I'd like for this to be a pre-submit figure out a way to get basic validation of non-root as pre-submit so we don't break it and we don't end up in a situation where the release is blocked and we have to scramble every month to, to figure out what happened to non-root. What if we'll um, add a tag for every, uh, for every of these additional tests that we want to test with non-root and then run it as, as a separate job, I guess? I mean, instead of instead of creating um, like duplicating all of this code, um, I, I feel like there are lots of tests that we need to uh, execute here. So add uh, a separate test lane 
that would just execute a subset of tasks that are yes. marked with this line. Okay, I see. Functionally, I don't think it matters. It's the same. We're, we're adding, <laughs> we have to run the tests with non root one way or the other. Yeah. So a separate test line or with just a subset or not, I don't know. Or we can decide that we're just making a switch and we no longer support the uh, non root. Oh, sorry, root. I think there's a transition period for us. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, adding a table is, is uh, code support. I mean, we need to support this code. So it will be easier to maintain it through a job like a single job on the last release or something so last kubernetes version so we'll have to add this table for very large amount of, set of tests we can get away with just a subset um, it's pretty widespread uh, from my point of view okay so in addition of a single lane, we create a label for the high impact tests that run this lane and non root. Does that sound like what we're leaning towards? I would think so, yeah. I mean, from my side. So that single lane would probably be that, I think it was thrown out just a minute ago, the highest version of Kubernetes that we support. Yeah. Do we have the, is there any concerns about adding this new lane with our existing infrastructure? Does it put more, do we have the overhead to do this or is that gonna cause problems? If, if it is a, a, a lane with a, a small subset of tests, I think it is okay. But what we can't do at the moment is like duplicating everything. And we would require duplicated resources for that. But it is if it is a single lane, I think it's okay. Okay, that sounds like the path forward then. So a label, identify the subset of tests that we wanna run in that lane and create a separate lane. Does anyone have any problems with that approach or uh, modifications yeah. to what I, I guess said? I guess my only concern is that how do we define uh, what is it, what is this minimum uh, minimum subset that we consider because it pretty much every corner case can cause an issue. <laughs> you can start with the conformance first and then see later. Maybe maybe I'm approaching it backwards. Do we have a understanding of exactly won't work like we know some things won't work with non root maybe we should be opting out certain tests uh, from this and run everything uh, by default so if you want to run everything then you you need to make it a periodic not to no, I mean, I mean, sorry, not not run all the test lanes with this. I'm, I'm saying uh, with our new test lane, when we're picking the subset of tests that we want to to execute within that and and non root, um, maybe I was taking, maybe what we want to run <laughs> everything and and select a few tests not to run. I, I don't even know if we can express that uh, with our our current test suite or not. But if it sounds like everything like 95 percent of the tests need to run at non-root then that's going to be a pain to add that label to every single one of them maybe we can add a label that's opt out of non-root instead to the subset of tests that can't run we, we just want to make sure that we don't break the feature it doesn't need to so i mean we can just run the basic positive tests for every feature so say for a survey if we have 10 tests it's, it's good enough if we run one of them don't really care about all the details. It's just to exercise the positive code flow, I suppose. So I, 
if I was to make an estimation, I wouldn't say it's like 90% of the tests, if that's what you're uh, getting at. Okay. Well, maybe we don't have to completely decide on this now. I think the thing that we can decide on is that we're going to enable a new test lane and somehow uh, enable a subset of tests or the whole, whatever makes sense within that test lane to exercise non root. But it's just one test lane that we're adding. Does that sound accurate to everyone at least? Yeah, I agree. Can you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. Ah, perfect. Uh... Yeah, I just, just I, I had the concern that it will be too big, and as Federico Federico mentioned that we need we want to have a small subset of tests, so the line will not uh, fail too often and block the PRs. Let's take a somewhere. Um... I mean, why not, why not just just um, uh, label the tests that definitely require root or would require root as root and uh, leave the rest out so that we have the subset of tests that will definitely not run without root. Oh, sounds like this doesn't make sense. Oh, why is there no one else? Oh. It, it does make sense. The problem is that you you want you will have a job that runs everything almost except let's say ten things, ten tests. So that is duplication of uh, will duplicate everything. That's a resource problem. But you can you I think we can just start for the next month. Let's say with a periodic and and monitor it and that's it. No 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 no. <laughs> Who, who's going to monitor this periodic? Is somebody going to wake up and have a uh, invest like task to investigate this periodic uh, every time? No, it because fails? it's not every time. I think that we should care only about. In my opinion, either we care about one one feature like that. Uh, you define something like conformant test or something similar to that. And you have a periodic that runs in parallel that will do cover everything that you expect. So uh, we do monitor the periodic. We have graphs for it, so we, we are supposed to be able to look at it. So, the periodic yeah. alerts us after something's been merged. That's the concern. We'd like to shift our fixes as far, I guess, to the left or whatever we're calling it, uh, to not. We want to gate this, ideally. Uh, at least have the uh, ability to gate it in some sense. Yes, yeah, so, but but uh, you could flip the coin. I mean, you could say, I'm I'm testing everything now with non-root, and only the exception is is uh, root specific, right? So so you you may break the 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 ones that require root. And you may break something there, but that's like uh, your less problematic, right? Do you, you understand what I mean? Yeah, I, uh, I guess it depends on how far we are with the non-root PR, what's missing there, and we need the other exceptions then. So right now, we are. Like more like it's getting close, but it's not the thing we want to tell people to use right now. I think so, it's getting very close. Yeah. So I think we should flip it as soon as we're confident that we think that is what people should use. But until then, that we should stay with the root test runs. From what I've seen, um, at least this morning, it's very close. Uh, there are a couple of issues that we can resolve, um, hopefully, very soon. Other than that, it seems pretty solid. So I, I want to get this merged as soon as possible. This, this is going to be a huge burden uh, to maintain. So what's the path of least resistance to get code merged that's executed? Uh, we have a pre-submit executing for it. Sounds like just a, a new lane. And then the path 
uh, the transitional path for us after we get this merged and we have a new lane to exercise some of it, whatever that means, is that we begin investigating how to uh, remove that lane and make this the default or, or come up with some way of, um, yeah, making this the default moving forward and what that entails. I just don't want us to get stuck on this one particular issue and not be able to make progress on merging something uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. So we've split the, the, our lanes into several, um, look at several groups. Perhaps we can, we can choose from, from these groups a subset of, of tests that we want to run for every group. And then uh, slowly uh, and then merge this PR and then slowly move the tests from existing um, lanes to the new lanes that execute uh, exercises the non root and then leave in the previous lanes only things that really don't work and we still want to make sure that uh, uh, they are still working with with root and everything else uh, will slow gradually move to non root lanes. I'm just afraid that the tests that are not currently able to run as non root, the subset is really low. I think SRIOV is like 10 tests, huge pages, maybe 10, and VirtuFS, maybe five. So, without, without VirtuFS, uh, I mean, SRIOV will be resolved with this. Uh... Yes, with a PR. Okay. That is so, actually, most, of yes. this, most of these issues are really gone. I mean, the, the only problem is the. Uh, VertiFS, which is, yeah. yeah, we know that this requires root. But yeah. regardless, there is also another issue with the huge pages that hopefully we can resolve. But everything else should just work. So what's, what's the outcome? I mean, there were multiple options. Uh, what's the consensus? I, I think that the last thing, uh, last option uh, was to have the pre submit, right? Uh, with the features we can right now run as non root. But there was also uh, a cons to this option that it will be probably a a too big lane that can cause some outages in the CI. So if, you, if we are okay with the lane being maybe a little bit bigger, then we can go with the option. That seems like the path of least resistance is to create a new lane and then kind of punt on this and begin transitioning or consolidating in the future once we have more experience. It will also be interesting what we will do with the C groups V2 feature, which is also right now running in a periodic afterwards. Ah, we'll see. Okay. So I will create a new line and we will see what's happening. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, speaking of CI, um, anybody want to talk about uh, CI issues that we had yesterday? Yeah, so we, we had a, an <laughs> Yeah, uh, we had a, a an outage with uh, in the in the uh, from in IBM uh, cluster, the one that runs uh, the the prow control plane, and yeah, this was a, a problem with uh, the DNS resolution internal in the cluster and also with external resources, and it was solved like at uh, uh, three uh, in, at the night uh, yesterday. Um, and yeah, it, it, it is already recovered. The, the support uh, people in, in IBM cluster 
uh, responded super quickly, but the resolution was not that uh, quickly. Um, we have implemented uh, um, a solution that can mitigate to some extent this, this kind of problems. This using the uh, node local DNS cache. Uh, in this, uh, the good thing is that is that this this cluster now that we have migrated from from the old uh, uh, cluster that ran the, the the control plane, uh, this new cluster allows this, this solution, the node local DNS cache, and with this with this option. Um, uh, there's a daemon set that is running a, a pod on all the all the nodes and the the queries are done to this to the, the local pod running in, in the node and not to the to the cluster wide core dns uh, uh, pods and then if there's uh, there are um, queries that can be solved but by this local uh, uh, daemon set running locally on its node then they are not forwarded and then to some extent this, this can, can be mitigated uh, uh, the next time so yeah let's let's see if we can improve in this sense and be less affected by infrastructure outages sounds like a good solution thank you federico no hey uh, i also noticed uh um daniel's been posting a, a job rec with red hat on linkedin for kubert ci yeah yeah we are we are that, looking for your group for for help, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it is the the job is is open. I don't have the link here, but I can I can share it and put it even in the in the document. Yeah, and yeah, we we that want would be awesome. I think uh, great. I think it would be very useful if, uh, for our non Red Hat friends to uh, see that job right and uh, yeah, as well as if any other company is uh, is hiring for. Uh, for Kubert related work, feel free to to speak up and talk about what you have and and uh, basically use our forum as a recruiting <laughs> mechanism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. I, I love the <laughs> <laughs> great. I, I love the the link to the document. Oh, Daniel has piped up with the link. Thank you, Daniel. Awesome. Thank you. And nobody spoke to me about it, so I was I was surprised. Yeah, we are we are looking for, for help. We we need we need more hands here. Cool. Hey uh speaking of the, the uh control plane, is that a, a donated uh infrastructure or how does how does that work? How do we uh how do we acquire that infrastructure? I, I don't. Uh, yeah, I think we we are we are uh, um, paying for it to to IBM. I'm, I'm not completely sure what what is a uh, what is a uh, status here. But but yeah, I think uh, uh, it is it is not don donated or anything like that. Okay. It is it is donated by Red Hat, and we are paying IBM. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, Red Hat is paying. Red Hat is is uh, paying to IBM. Which is weird, right? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like some Enron type. Like <laughs> we're buying stuff from a, a subsidiary and. <laughs> Cool. That's uh, interesting to know how how those infrastructure bits are are given to the project. Okay. Oh, thank you, Federico. Uh, that takes us to the end, and we are at seven forty two Pacific time. Um, nothing in the open floor. Just, um, Chris, uh, just one thing. Um, I've just posted both things. One, the thing for Cupid CI, Principal Software Engineer offering. And the other one, we are also hiring for uh, OpenShift virtualization, which also uh, involve, is involving uh, in uh, Qubit upstream work, if anyone is interested. 
So just uh, so you know. Fantastic. It's good to know that uh, there are excellent job breaks out there uh, in today's bad market. Okay. Um, no, no uh, items in the open floor. No poll requests that we want to talk about. Do we feel like doing a bug scrub today? Just 10 minutes. Shouldn't take more. Okay. Peter has spoken and says yes. I'll stop sharing so he can take over. Somehow. There we go. Thanks. There's just a couple of uh, issues from the last week. Okay. All right. Um, first one, a bird cattle not able to find VM resources, blah, blah, blah. And I saw that Lubo answered here, so I'll just go ahead. Well, Mark. Hold, hold up. So what, I've, I've seen this twice now, where people say that the namespace doesn't, are we not documenting this? Let's make sure that we're, we're documenting that the namespace option exists, because I think it's not obvious to people. Uh, I, I've definitely gotten asked this more than once. I've even had people tell me that we don't support namespace um, for Vert CTL. And I had to go into the code and say, yeah, we do. It's right here. Ah, uh, oh, just a brain freeze. OK, uh, I guess you. Um, so th does the help task, uh, help text um, display the namespace option? That's what we need to investigate. Somebody needs to do that. You, you can assign yes, it to me. Yes, it does. It does, OK. Yeah, I mean, uh, you go and do a weird CTL options help, and it will show up. Options help. Would that be uh, obvious? Uh, like it's the some, same like for cube CTL. That's, yes. I mean, yeah. If somebody does first CTL help start or start help, would they see? They wouldn't see any no. space. No. Okay. No. Um, shall we just close it? I mean, I, I mean, if somebody doesn't isn't able to figure this out after using cube cuddle, it's. Uh, I don't know if co-documenting this in the user guide would make this easier. If it's consistent with Q uh, control, then close it. Yeah, it's exactly awesome. so. You write virtual options, and you see all the commands which you can add to any command. And it's really back then I copied it from the kubectl help text and modified it basically. I have to go. Sorry. Uh, good luck. Bye. Okay, this one is easy. Oh. Uh, this one is yours, Chris. Do you want to give us a heads up? Oh, um, yes. I think uh, Roman answered my question yesterday in mailing list. Yeah, so uh, I'm not sure if it makes sense to have this list, dependency list outside of the repo somewhere. Because yeah, we have so, out and it's listed there. Uh, this popped up uh, reviewing the, the due diligence uh, external dependencies and uh, uh, it's related to uh, making sure it's related to license compliance. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that that, uh, that that dependency list was still accurate since it's, it's been a few years. Yeah, it's for sure definitely not accurate. <laughs> um, um, yeah, uh, and I mean, we have the foster check, as I told you there, where you can, where it even scans our recontrol dependencies. It's just pretty funny. I think we installed at some point with pip j2 just for one test where we check if a template is uh, Jinja 2 compatible. And foster pulls in into the report all Jinja 2 dependencies as a project dependency, which is pretty funny. Uh, so uh, there are now 50, pro 50 repos or so which Foster can't identify the license with, and but I mean we 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 don't depend on Ginger or anything. Yeah. 
and just uh, it's a little bit unclear to me what to do with that. Okay, well, like, but I guess in general it should be good enough if we have the fossil list curated and pass the fossil test. Is it not? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm still in uh, just going through all these bullet points and just saw this one and created an issue on it. But I'm, I'm pretty happy with your response in the mailing list. No, so I, can, just, I can run with that. Then let me just copy my response. Yes. Link to Good it idea. there. Uh, Um, so, Chris, is this good enough? And can we close it, or do you expect anything uh, else yeah, to be added? I'm, I'm happy with that. Cool. Thanks. We can close it. Okay. Error and live migration using third couple. Would you have an answer? What happened? I want to live migrate VM using vertical, but I'm getting the error. Error migrating virtual machine. The server has asked for the client to pro provide credentials. Uh, Rings, any bells? One. Would be interesting to see where where this Kubernetes is hosted. Um, in general, we tend to support the same authentication plugins like kubectl. But if they host it somewhere and download the kubectl from there, there may be additional authentication plugins it compiled into kubectl, and then mm -hmm. we may not be able to talk to the cluster. Mm -hmm. But um is there it can also be something completely different <laughs> <laughs> well this is better than nothing so is there anything special about the way to access your convertis api server um this gets us anywhere. Um, any logs that we can ask for and it may be useful to triage this? Hmm. Or this is just from Vertical. Vertical dash VVV or something? <laughs> Do we have to? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um. Oh, not VVV, it's Sesh V9. <laughs> but, yeah. Awesome, thanks. Let's see what he's saying. Next one, <laughs> it's covered 37 support has plug data, data volume. Oh, that's easy to answer. No. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's available as a preview in 041. It goes in 040. Sure. Ah, you know, there's 039, thank you, great. Michael is maybe still here? No, he left already. Um, let me see the change log, maybe it will be there. Okay. All right. And that's... 41. 
Oh. Oh, but it's here. Ah, the support hold block with root CTL. Ah, ah. And this one is for the. Yeah, ah. yeah, 39 looks good. Yeah, no, it's just. It's also just a fix. <laughs> Come on. Um, okay, I think. Yeah, so I guess 39 is the first one we see something. I would recommend 040 then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's make it as this, whatever. Um, and close it. Okay, let's try to get these two as well so we get it to one week. Um, how to make a snapshot in one click recovery? Do we do have relevant documents? That's probably something you could give. Alex and Michael to check the user guides what we have there. I think we're a little bit behind on these new storage features in the user guide. Yeah, snapshot restore is nothing in the user guide. So we miss documentation for the feature. Okay, uh, do you know there is any work covering this? I would ask Michael Henry since he wrote it. Ah, right. Okay. To 041 invert launcher again for network traffic to video. And they use Calico as we do on the CI. Hmm. Uh, yes, for the rollback, I mean, we can advise him what to do for the rollback apart from investigating if there is an issue. For the rollback, what you probably not do is um, setting the rollback version in the Qbert CR. So you probably just roll back the operator manifest, which you should not do. You should stick with the 041 operator, but specify in the context. Issue we are running Calico on our CIs. Fail. Um, so, uh, so the rollback is again something. I have to keep hoping maybe here it is. Yeah, uh, let me give you command line, something like this patch, just with the other value with v0, 34, and the new operator. <laughs> it's not <an> old <laughs> one. But I think he wrote oh. his own 0, 041, right? Or is it, sir? Because it's... Yes. Yeah, because you were please stick with the 0039 operator. Ah, okay, sorry. Insert. Uh oh. Yeah. 
put our Ascot code here. I'm all over the place. Um, Arbitrary network debugging questions, and I think we are done. And on double DR. Thanks for help. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, that Bye. concludes this week's uh, edition of Kubert Weekly Meeting. Thank you for joining us, everybody, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks.